Some people say that the grass is greener on the other side, but we say the grass is greener where you cultivate the soil. Second Kings chapter 2 and verse number 9 reads like this, And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Welcome to Double Portion Podcast. Aggravating circumstances in my life. Welcome back, Double Portion Nation. So good to be with you here tonight, today, wherever it is in your mythical part of the world. I'm glad to be with you. What's Thank with you. the hat? This is my new. This is my new bus ministry merch. Crew two thirty eight. Uh, Crew two thirty eight. We have an incredible bus ministry here yeah. in the church, and that that's their new hat, huh? Yes, it is. So what? I'm repping. Oh, cool. Represent. And I'm actually wearing my Hope Corps shirt, too. <coughs> Welcome right. to the podcast that advertises free advertisement. <laughs> no, it ain't free. Bus <laughs> Ministries pay me a lot. Oh, okay. <laughs> they said they would pay me a lot of money if I wore this hat tonight, so I said, okay. No, actually, I'm wearing it because I support our bus ministry. God's doing great things. And uh, so you're going to probably see more merch on this on this podcast hopefully it'll be ours ours will be out and about i'm hoping within a week week and a half oh that's cool so our merch is going to be out pretty soon hats hoodies and then it's just going to grow from there we're putting together a store right now so be looking for that look for that in all of our social media platforms but we're glad to be with you tonight we're glad that you're here with us. and uh, we Tonight? Are, yes, it is tonight <laughs> where we are in our part of the world. Wherever you're at, we're glad to be with you. And uh, we're excited about getting into tonight, this whatever it is. <laughs> I do want to say a couple of things before we get started. Uh, we've been getting some comments lately. Um we actually got one from a local here, Sister Betty Padilla. She said that she loves listening to the podcast and that it was very good. So we appreciate that feedback. We thank you for uh, commenting. That is that is a driving force to keep us going. We're glad that people are listening. And then a couple of weeks ago, actually one of our friends from Cheyenne, Wyoming, Brother Dallas Keith, commented in as well. So... We're going to give both of you a hand. Keep the comments coming. If you're listening on your podcast platforms, I know a lot of people are listening on YouTube, but if you're listening on your podcast platforms, if you'll rate us and give us a comment, that helps us to defeat the algorithms and uh, we can rise to the top and be bigger than all the best. You know, Joe Rogan, those guys... We'll reach the top and uh, go above those, if, except uh, I think Joe Rogan's only on Spotify right now. Nobody else will let him on. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> yeah, he's only making like a couple hundred million off of Spotify. So we're not there yet, but almost. <laughs> but uh, we're, we, are, we are excited about tonight. As you know, uh, Brother Mitchell opened us up talking about the ideology that the grass is greener on the other side. It is a tendency, not just in young people, but in the lives of everyone, to look at the successes of others, the uh, uptimes of others, and especially in a social media world, to look at the highlight reels of their life and to think to yourself, well, if I was there then my life could be like that. And uh, 
I feel like this is significant today because um, yesterday we were we were just in a powerful service, uh, powerful services all all day long in both campuses here in Pueblo and in Greeley. God was moving in a powerful way, but our bishop began to preach a lot about this idea, this thought process that. Uh, if you go somewhere else, if you can just get the right opportunity, if you can be around the right people, then somehow that will change your circumstance and your situation to become somehow better. And then you can in turn, you know, do whatever you accomplish your dreams, uh, maybe get a better job, make more money. All of the thoughts that go through the minds of young people. And uh, we kind of want to, not kind of, we want to debunk that fact tonight. It's not about the grass is greener anywhere else. It's about the fact that you've got to cultivate the place that you're in. You've got to make the environment suitable for your success and your fulfillment of the will of God. So, Bishop, we're glad to have you tonight. We're here with Brother Mitchell, Bishop Elder, and Brother Jordan Pound. He is not a bot for all of our northern friends. He is a real person. <laughs> and we're actually going to have a podcast very soon with him. Be looking out for that because he does so much around here in IT. But you'll see him. He's real. He's real. Don't make me put the camera on him right now. <laughs> yeah, we'd have to get up, and then we'd trip over wires all over this yeah. office. Yeah. But, Bishop, we're, we're glad to have you back tonight. You weren't with us last week because you were preaching all over the, the world. But we're glad to have you back tonight. Thank you. I'm, abs I'm absolutely delighted to be back with, first of all, my sons, Jeffrey and Mitchell and Brother Jordan Pound, and then all of my wonderful friends— uh, that are part of the Double Portion Podcast family, and uh, we are just so thrilled to have you with us, and um, and uh, um, I'm glad to be back. I've, I've missed being there, and so uh, being here, actually, so it's, it's good to be with you. Um, Brother Jeffrey mentioned that... Uh, We've dealt with this a little bit here in uh, the services that we had this past Sunday, which, I don't know, you may listen to this podcast six months from now, and so it's around the 1st of April. I think today is the 2nd of April, isn't it? The 4th. The 4th. So it would have been the 3rd of April, and uh, we talked a little bit about this This actually come out of me studying the book of Genesis. It's the first part of the year, so in my Bible reading, I'm going through again, and uh, I made it to Genesis chapter 26, and there was some very, very interesting uh, uh, illumination of God in this chapter, very in-depth. My personal feeling is that Genesis holds the genetics of all of the the doctrine and the teaching of God in the Bible, the beginning of all that. It is the book of beginning. And I would have to go and look again, but I, the Hebrew word is actually where we get our word genetic. And that is where we also get the word Genesis for the name of this book. And so we understand that Genetics is where uh, the makeup of who we are, our identity, uh, the framing of humanity, and there's so much in this chapter. The area that we're focusing on is that chapter 26 of Genesis opens up with the statement, and there was a famine in the land. And this was before the first famine that, that Abraham had encountered. And this is fascinating because in both situations, Abraham and Isaac, his son, 
at various years apart, I'm digging around, I think there's probably around 50 years difference between the first and the second famine. I'd, I'm not sure of that totally. But from what I can gather and the, the somewhat limited study that I've looked at this, uh, that's about the amount of time between these two famines. And both of them find themselves in the same country, the land of Girar, or Girar, however they pronounce that, which is part of the land of the Philistines. In the Bible, the Philistine people were always the enemy of God's people. Now, in today's world, from Calvary, we don't look at any other person as our enemy. Uh, our enemy is Satan and the spirits that are allied with Satan and the the thought processes that Satan would develop in our life, which then affects our behavior and our actions. So that's our enemy. But the Bible will use these stories as metaphors and analogies to teach us by example what is our enemy. And in this particular story, they were an actual people that were the enemy of God. And um, Isaac went to the king of this land, Gerar, Gerar, whose name was Abimelech. And uh, the Lord appeared unto Isaac in this second verse, and this is where we really want to focus tonight. The Lord appeared unto Isaac and said, Go not down into Egypt. And Egypt was another area that was at this time. These people were enemies to God's people, not so much in a physical sense, but in an identity sense, where it was always a temptation of God's children to identify with these nations other than with God. And at this time, as in always, God's people are sojourning people. We are pilgrims in this land. We used to sing a lot about this. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, there were many, many songs talking about this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Yes. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. <coughs> and that was so much a part of the, the legacy of Pentecost. Many people during that time were, were very poor, uh, and life was hard in those days. Uh, they didn't have uh, a lot of the amenities that we have today. There were not a lot of the social programs that we have today. So uh, times were tough and people looked forward to being with Jesus. Um, I still think that the Lord is coming. I think his soon return is sooner than we can even imagine. Yeah. However, until he comes, Jesus said, occupy till I come. And part of the, the, well, let's use a word that's overused today, but I'll use it for lack of a better word, and I'll use it because you'll relate to it. But part of the narcissistic society that we live in is uh, wanting everything right now. And so we have, we have children that grow up with a steady diet of Hollywood and every storyline in every movie that you see in Hollywood, the people are always unblemished, good looking, in perfect health, unless they're the bad guy. Super rich. Super rich, driving the latest Whoever pays the most, I think Audi has paid the most right now because in all the advertisements I see regarding movies, because I don't have a television, don't believe in having a television, don't need one in my life. Uh, but 
a lot of the advertisements that I read about because I want to stay up to date as much as possible with relating with people in the world. It seems like that Audi is the go-to vehicle of Hollywood right now. And in the back of my mind, I'm old enough and I'm, I'm just uh, cynical enough to think how much money did Audi pay these companies for their cars to be used in all of these movies or whatever, because the bottom line is money. But in these movies, in these advertisements, in these narratives, uh, we always see instant success. We see people that are at the top immediately, and that rarely ever happens. There are incidences and there are cases where people rise to the top of the definitive world that they're in. And and I'm using that expression rising to the top loosely because my idea, my definition of success and rising to the top is totally different than the world that we live in. We are sojourners. And, and this is what Isaac was doing. He was sojourning through the land and the Lord tells him, to go not to Egypt, but to dwell in the land which God would tell him of. And that land was this land of Gerar or Gerar. Yeah. It was right here. It was actually his land. The Philistines were actually squatting on it. But many, many years ago, Abraham had sojourned through there. And God said, everywhere you put your foot, that land belongs to you. And Abraham actually dug wells here when he came through here. And there were similar stories that occurred here. Uh, I don't want to go down that road, but it's fascinating. The first message I preached out of this deals with the fact that both Abraham's wife, Sarah, and Isaac's wife were magnificently beautiful and so attractive that both of them lied about their wives so that they wouldn't get knocked off by somebody or killed. And uh, and then somebody steal their wife. That's the kind of world that they lived in at that time. That's a whole different podcast for another day. But um, this happened, and and so when Abimelech sees Isaac flirting with his wife, and the Bible says sporting her, the Old English Bible. He recognizes that is not his sister as he told me she was, but that is his wife. And so out of this, the Bible says in verse 6 that Isaac dwelt there as God had instructed him. And, and so Abimelech goes through this whole process of telling everybody don't touch his wife. And that's a whole other story. Because if this is the same Abimelech that... Abraham, Isaac's father, encountered when Abraham and Sarah, who was also drop-dead gorgeous, uh, came in there. And there's a whole story behind that we don't have time to deal with tonight. But uh, Abimelech himself looked upon her to take her for his wife. But God gave Abimelech a dream and said, if you touch this woman, you're dead because she's another man's wife. And it's fascinating to me because I'm sure that he did not have the the moral structure in his culture that Abraham had in his. They worshipped, uh, Abraham worshipped the one true God and Abimelech worshipped idols and thought they were gods. So uh, he instructs the men of that of that area, the Philistine men, that she is married to leave her alone. And he gives Isaac a portion of land. The Bible talks about this. And God instructs Isaac to dwell there. And so the Bible says that Isaac sowed in that land. Yeah. And when he did, it's fascinating if you read it in the Bible, that God blessed his effort. And he reaped in one year 100-fold. Now, when I was studying this, and I don't know, I've looked, I've looked on satellite. I have read everything and get my hands on. I have Googled it. 
of course, it's got to be right if it comes from Google because they have fact checkers on yeah. Google that makes everything right, tongue in cheek. Uh, and they're learning English. Most of them right now, they only speak Chinese, but they are learning English. And I couldn't resist that. <laughs> but uh, um, what that has to do, nothing here. I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud. But uh, um, everything that I've looked at this from the pictures that I've observed, uh, it's not the most fertile land. And with Abimelech not really being the bosom buddy of Isaac, I don't think he's going to give him the choice fertile land of that country. And so, so much of this deals with our lives, ladies and gentlemen. We're never going to probably, well, there's words I don't like to use. I don't like to use the word never, and I don't like to use the word always, unless it's apropos. But more than likely, life is not going to put you in the perfect situation. Yeah. And life is not going to give you the choicest land and the most fertile land. And so if it's left up to the, the concepts of our world today, they just want you to just move off, find the most place. And sometimes that's part of the will of God. But I want to make this statement openly and unapologetically right at the front. You don't need to be moving anywhere if you don't have the blessing of the man of God in your life. First of all, Second of all, I would never make a decision to move if I did not scope out the land and make sure that there is a very good, godly, apostolic church where my family can stay in the land. Yeah. And thirdly, more than likely, you can be just as blessed where you are unless the, it's the will of God that you move. You can be blessed more where you are than if you go sojourning down to Egypt or wherever you want to traipse off to. And, uh, but this is what's so fascinating about this story is that Abraham and Isaac both were blessed by God during the time of famine. And so, uh, this, you guys can break in here anytime you want to. This thing, I'm not going to preach the whole message again. But I do want it to be apropos to uh, uh, our lives today because that's what it is. Yeah. Um, and so the soil is the whole deal about farming. People do not realize when you talk of farming, the farmer doesn't really care about the seed. He does. I mean, he wants certified seed, but the word of God is certified. It's going to bring forth fruit. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if we, if we sow the word of God in our life, more than likely it's going to bring forth fruit if it finds fertile soil. And so there's a lot that the Bible has to say about the soil of our lives. Jesus gives us a parable, maybe one of you guys can find it, about the soil. And he talks about a certain man went out to sow, and he sowed seed upon four different types of soil. And I don't know where that's at. Maybe one of you Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. Somebody want to just give us the four, I mean, they can read it, but... Uh, what's the first soil that he sows upon? Sowed by the wayside. Sowed by the wayside. Sowed upon stony places. He sowed upon stony places. He sowed upon... He, some seed fell among the thorns. Okay. And some fell upon good ground. All right. And in this particular parable, he doesn't spend a lot of time with the soil. Uh but Jesus gives another parable where he does deal with the soil. And in this, he is showing, in, in that day and age, the 
the only way that they had to sow was by broadcasting. That's actually where we get the term broadcasting. And when you broadcast seed, you're literally just taking handfuls of that seed and you are throwing it out with your hands. And they call that broadcasting. And you want to make that you want to make that seed fly out of your hand as broadly as you can. So you'll use these sweeping motions while you're releasing that seed out of your hand so that it will be broadcast in a wider sense. They don't do that too much anymore. They have machines that are called drills that will actually dig tiny little holes at a very fast pace and it will drop seed into those holes and then bury that See, it's called a drill. They drill that seed into the soil today. But that's the last part of it. Really, the whole key to, the, to having an effective harvest, number one, is the favor of God. That is first and foremost. To any person that is watching or listening to this, I cannot overemphasize finding the will and the favor of God. Yeah. And most of the time at a young age, if I'm speaking to young men and young ladies, you normally find the will of God by learning his ways instead of just, oh, I got to find the will of God. I got to find the will of God. Well, let's learn his ways. And by learning his ways, his will will be revealed to us. Yeah. For example, in Psalms 103, the Bible says that Moses knew the ways of God. And because Moses knew the ways of God, the children of Israel saw the action of God. Moses learned his ways. And through learning his ways, Moses discovered the will of God for his life, which was to lead his people out of bondage. That would have never happened if Moses had not known the ways of God. So uh, that's where we begin, and that is cultivating the right things in our life, the right, the soil of our life. This parable that Jesus gives is of four types of soil. Now, I come from farm country, and there are very productive wayside harvests yeah. in Kansas. Yeah. They literally will cut the hay out of the ditches along the sides of the roads. And many farmers in Kansas will contract many miles of state highway and they will cultivate those ditches and they will plant brome and timothy grass in those ditches and they'll come through there and people will throw their trash and they'll clean that trash out and they'll come in with a, uh, what, what do they call that, mower for hay? A swather. A swather and they will swat that hay and they will come in with a baler and either use it to make a lot of money by feeding cattle or by selling it to feed lots. And you will see that uh, many times in the summer where they will cut those ditches out, which is the wayside. Uh, and so, uh, but that soil is cultivated to produce. So, uh, in this particular instance, instance the, the, the wayside did not produce the fruit that it, it should have produced. And then there is the rocky or the stony soil. Yeah. Man, Jesus knew what he was talking about. Because I've been to Israel. And that has got to be the rockiest, stoniest, stoniest. I don't know if that's a word, but if it's not, I just made it a word. That's a great, that's the great thing about being an American is if you don't have a word, you can make your own word. But uh, yet that is the stoniest soil that I've ever seen in my life. And yet it produces phenomenally. And one of the reasons is because they're blessed by God. Yeah. The favor of God is upon them. And another reason is they know how to cultivate that soil. And, and Jesus talks about this where there is a fig. There's a, this, there's a parable that Jesus gives about a man that has a fig orchard a fig grove and where's that is that still Matthew chapter 13 no it's in Luke and Jesus gives this parable about this man that comes here 
and I'm taking a little more time than I wanted to, to but you have to get the right context before you bring the application and in this the owner of the fig grove comes and he finds this fig tree that does not produce Luke chapter 13 and a certain man verse number 6 and a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came and sought forth fruit thereon and found none then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years have I come three years seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if it not, then after that shall... Uh, thou shalt cut it down. What's significant about him saying that I've come this these three years is that in the research that I've done, a fig tree will not produce from anywhere, anywhere from three to five years. So he was giving it the very least amount of time for it to produce. And he was saying, well, if it's not going to produce in three years, then cut it down. Which is significant because as a farmer, if you have something that's not producing, then, you know, you, you've got to get rid of it. If you've got a cow that's not producing, if you've got a, a three-year-old cow that's not dropping calves, you've got to get her out of the herd. If you've got a plant that's not producing, you've got to get rid of it because it's partaking of the nutrients of the soil. But the... The husbandman of the vineyard said, no, I know there's potential there. I know there's capabilities there. I see the signs of this producing fruit. Give me one more year. What else is significant about that is he didn't do one thing to the tree. Yeah. He didn't say anything about, well, let me prune it. Because that is an important part of an orchard is pruning <coughs> the plant. And there's times where... In our life, we need pruning as a plant, but the soil of our life has to be prepared. Yeah. And there's just so much about this in Scripture that deals with this in great detail as the preparation. And I maintain, young man, young lady, at the, at the youth of your life, the more you prepare your life, the better you can produce anywhere that you go. For example, uh, let's say that you want to be a doctor or whatever, or you want to be a high-skilled laborer, which in my mind is just as a valuable uh, uh, attribute to humanity as being a doctor. Uh, and it takes as much education to do some of the high skills effectively so you have to cultivate the right characteristics at an early age the greatest singers in the world start early the greatest musicians in the world start early the greatest gymnasts in the world start early the greatest uh i was i i was looking for something i was look i was actually looking for a message on youtube a few months ago and you know how those they'll They'll throw advertisements, and there's this little four or five year old kid playing basketball, and his handle was 50 times greater than my handle ever was at the greatest times of my life. And I found out later he belonged to some professional basketball, he was one of his sons. Well, he had such a huge head start because that was his personal dream and his personal vision. And I'm just using these as an example that the more prepared that we become for the call of God in our life, Paul puts it like this, someone like that little guy or someone that is in the sports world or someone that's in the entertainment world, they, they run the race for an earthly prize. And that's what we're talking about is it, and he's using the illustration of running a race, but we're, 
We're talking about your life and what you're going to do with your life. So, um, there's some ways that you can prepare the soil of your life, young man and young lady, and start at an early age. One of the most important ingredients to put in the soil of your life is the Word of God. I started at an early age. We we started Jeffrey and Mitchell and Melody, all of our children, quizzed for the... I don't know how old were you, Jeff, when you first started quizzing. Seven, eight, nine. Oh, probably about eight or nine. Yeah. And uh, I quizzed when I was a kid. Uh, I also uh, had the wonderful uh, inspiration of a man that came and preached. And he inspired me so much because I was at a personal relationship with him. He was, a, he became a friend. I think he's still alive today. He's one of the greatest preachers I've ever heard. Brother Robert Bear, who I love dearly and had time to spend with him personally and would watch his preparation. And Brother Robert Bear's calling was to be a preacher and an evangelist. And he was one of the greatest I'd ever heard especially in a local setting. But he gave himself to the Word of God. And uh, I could not do that because that's not the call that God gave to me. And what I mean by that is he would spend many hours a day. I would watch him. He would walk and he would have three by five index cards. He would have the scriptures that he was going to use on those index cards and he would review them for I don't know how many hours a day. And when he would go to the pulpit at night, he would go without a Bible. One night I heard him preach a message called The Incomparable Christ. And for two hours and 40 minutes, he quoted over 1,500 scripture, scriptural references of who God was as Jesus Christ without a Bible. And he quoted, I don't know how many hundreds of references from history of people talking about Christ. Well, it's obvious that he had prepared that soil for a long time, for his calling. But what would we do, young man, young lady, if we began to prepare a life for the calls that God's placed in our life? And some of them will be, first and foremost, ministry. But not everybody's called to preach. Not everybody is called to sing. Not everybody is called to be in that form of ministry. Maybe God has called you to do a business, and that business becomes your ministry. And I don't think that every young person has to move off to a big city to be effective. I think if there is cultivation and preparation and prayer, uh, that, that God can prepare that soil. And the reason why I say that prayer and fasting and giving oneself to God is so important is because if you read this story, the huge part of Isaac's success was the favor of God. That was massive. The Bible says, Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year 100-fold. And then it says, The Lord blessed him, and the man waxed great. This was in a time of famine. Everybody else was starving. Yeah. Everybody else was going to the poorhouse. And because of this, the Bible says that the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants. And of course, when all that started happening in his life, the Bible says that the Philistines envied him. So they come and ask him to get out of there. And, and I say all that, young man and young lady, because or anybody, my fellow Roman citizens or whoever. I'm, I'm joking, of course. But um, I say that because if we will do this God's way, and if we are, there's some other thing. Jeff and Mitch helped me out. Cultivating a faithfulness to the house of God. No matter what your friends do, I'm going yeah. to church. There has been a bad habit that's been established in our world since COVID. And that is just whenever you don't feel like going to church, you just don't go to church. Well, I'll just watch it online. Well, in, in the end, that's going to reach up and bite you. 
yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Somewhere down the road, that's going to bite you. It's like I, I, I run schools before, and I'd see kids cheating, and and for the moment they think they got away with it, but somewhere down the road they're going to need that knowledge. Yeah. So the person they're really cheating is themselves. Well, one scripture that I think I think we find the idea of cultivation, and it, you know, it doesn't wouldn't say it in that so in so many words, but is the Book of Psalms, chapter one. When it opens up, and and the opening is a blessing, which I believe all of us want to be blessed. And the blessing is, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of, un, of the ungodly, which <clears throat> the terminology there, man, is speaking about humanity. It's not speaking of the male gender, speaking of humanity that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So this blessed man is cultivating his environment that he is not, he's not uh, walking in the counsel of, a, of the ungodly, standing in the way of sinners, or sitting in the seat of the scornful. And this is just a side note. Um, it's not original with me, but it's, it's intriguing to me that we find a digression in this man's life because he is not in those that are not blessed because if you don't cultivate the soil first off you're walking you're making progression you're going forward and then you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly then it digresses standing in the way of sinners and then you're sitting in the seat of the scornful if you're not cultivating an environment in your life of the word of God, the spirit of God, which you'll get to later on in this chapter. There's a digression in your life to where all of a sudden now you can sit around and an example is talk bad about everybody in the church, talk bad about the preacher, talk bad. And all of a sudden now you're sitting around with the Philistines envying the blessed man because the blessed man is not doing these things. He's, he's busy. He's busy doing the work of God. And he's being blessed because the Bible says if you don't do these things, you're blessed. You're just like Isaac. He's going out. He's digging wells. He's doing all of these things. He's planting the seed. And God is blessing him. And here's the Philistines. Well, oh, Isaac, if he would just, you know, if I had the opportunities that Isaac had, if I had the 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 kind of uh yeah if i had his family's name yeah and, you know his his dad is a preacher or, or his dad is the owner of whatever exactly you know and and so there's many ways that you can sit around and be scornful or you can get up and cultivate the land and and when you cultivate that land the bible says he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and I love this scripture because this shows a, a sustenance to one's life. Trees don't just pop up overnight. Yeah, and they don't move every three years. No. If you're going to be, I mean, go to the great Sequoia Redwood uh, forest. And I have been there. Some of those are thousands of years old. I didn't just decide one day, well, I'm going to be a Sequoia Redwood. And I'm just going to get up and, and I'm going to be... A great Sequoia Redwood. No, there was a progression of life. There were hard times that that Redwood had to survive. There were blizzards. There were dry seasons and fire fires. When you look around where we live, we have a lot of cottonwoods. And we live in a, in a high desert, a uh, high plains desert was the, is what they call it. And there's not a lot of surface water. And you can watch, you go around a creek bed, and it's a dry as a bone. There's not one drop of water in that creek bed. But there's beautiful green cottonwoods. And that's how you know there's a possibility of water. The pioneers used this when they would be going across the plains. They'd be like, oh, look, there's a stand of cottonwoods. There's possibly water there. And the reason there's an understanding there's water there, because you may get there and it may be dry, but that cottonwood 
could have a root system that goes down 120 feet. And when what sustained the cottonwood through the years of drought, through the years of famine. And so wind, the terrible winds out here. Yeah. People talk about hurricanes and 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 those are terrible. But we we use hurricane rated shingles on our homes out here because it's not uncommon every spring to have several days where the wind will gust up to a hundred miles an hour. Here. Our, on our farm this last year in La Hunta, which is kind of the area that I'm talking about, there was a sustained wind of 108 miles an hour. That is... That's hurricane rated. Yeah. What, four? I, cat I, four? I can't remember. I looked at what category it is, but it's it's not a high category, but it's one of the lower categories, but it's still a, a hurricane. And those cottonwoods are still out there. And our cottonwoods, <laughs> we were praying for the cottonwoods because we got a bunch around our house. That we want. That we yeah. don't want to fall on our house. But they sustained through that storm because they were that tree that was, and it went down into the root system or, or into a, it found a, a well of water. It says, like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The leaf shall not wither is speaking of dry times. Yep. It's speaking of drought. And an important point to point out in this scripture, you say, well, it's, it's not dealing with the soil, but it really is. It really is dealing with the soil there. Uh, one of the keys is that you find the right seed for the soil. And uh, there are seeds of righteousness that the Bible talks about. That if you plant these seeds in the human heart, that they will produce things that brings God's favor. And um, there are seeds of unrighteousness that just do not fit in humanity. The, the seeds of disobedience, the seeds of, of rebellion. And I know there's a place for rebellion. You've got to rebel against sin. But every time that you see rebellion in the Bible, a holy rebellion, it was very brief. It was just for a very brief time. And then God told Moses, you pick that rebellion up. When he threw down that snake, it became a, or that rod, it became a snake. But he said, you pick it up by the tail, you get it, you get it back under control because rebellion can destroy. Don't want to get on that. Uh, but um, the important thing is that the right seeds go in the right soil. It would be uh, it would be a waste of time to go down into the delta there in Arkansas and plant wheat, where they grow rice by the millions of bushels, yeah. and it would be a waste of time to bring that rice up to Kansas and plant it. Where in very fertile soil, where Kansas produced more wheat than the rest of the world combined last year, except for China. Uh, that's how much I think it was like six hundred billion, or no, six hundred million, almost a, over a half a billion bushels of wheat were produced in the state of Kansas alone last year, because it has the soil for the right kind of seed. The Bible says, "Sow to yourself in righteousness." And so there are seeds of righteousness that if we plant, then so much more that the farmer learns is the pH balance of the soil. If the, with the pH balance is the environment of life, not only in soil, but in humanity. And, and, so, and in a church, the pH balance has to be right. If the pH balance is off, then the whole, the whole soil system or the whole body becomes too acidic for an environment of life. And when we think of acid, we think of battery acid. But really the word acidic just simply means it's unstable. And so uh, you may have in your own life, if you've got too much criticalness in your life, that's acidic. You're, you're, the, the soil of your life becomes unbalanced. There is no such thing as constructive criticism. That is an oxymoron. I'm not saying there's not a time and a place for criticism, but it's not constructive. All criticism is destructive, and there is a time to tear some things down. 
But don't call that constructive. That's destructive. And if you're going to tear something down, then it needs to be, something needs to go in there and either rebuilt or replace it. So if you're going to criticize, don't do it too much because then the soil becomes acidic and you sow into that that young man or that young lady unbelief. Parents, I'm talking to you. When you correct your kids, Jeff and Mitch, you can verify this. How many times did you hear me say growing up, my correction is not rejection? How many times did you hear me verbally tell you, and I've said it over the pulpit as a pastor correcting, my correction is never rejection. And because in the world that we live in today, Satan would put it in people's mind that if you're being corrected, that's rejection. That is not. And so these seeds in that area, uh, seeds of good habits, seeds of good hygiene, for crying out loud, young man, young lady, get up and make your bed. Quit being such a lazy person. Uh, I know that went over like a crocheted bathtub, but that's the truth. Get up, make your bed, hang your clothes up, put your shoes in order. You know, my dad was an army ranger. If he come in and saw my bed unmade, it was Katie bar the door, you know. I don't know whatever Katie bar the door means, but anyway, it was Katie bar the door. And uh, so there's there's good habits. There's good processes of thought in the soil of your life. Good work ethic. Work ethic is one of the best things you can develop in the soil of your life. Mitch, you have a comment? Well, I was just thinking a couple weeks ago we talked about, we were talking about defining moments and we used the we use the book of Ruth. And in this book, it actually, we talked about how Naomi was allowing uh, a bad situation <clears throat> to define her. But what, when that story starts, you find they are leaving the house of bread, Bethlehem. They leave Bethlehem. They go to Moab. Because they're looking for bread, but what's fascinating is you don't find any reference of the harvest of or of bread or of anything of that nature until they come back. And then when Naomi comes back, then you find references to the harvest, to that which would produce bread. But you find it in the field where Boaz has taken the time to cultivate the soil. And so the thing that Naomi is chasing, she chases it into Moab. And I'm sure they found sustenance there. They lived. But really, I think it's important to realize the scripture points to the fact that she found bread when she went to the place where Boaz is. He's cultivating it. He's in the field where he's sown into the soil and he's harvesting. We, there's multiple examples uh, another example would be the story of Lot, where he looks to what he thinks would the be a fertile good place. Yeah, the fertile valley. Yeah. It says that it was well watered. And it, it actually says something interesting there. It says that it was well watered like the garden of the Lord before he destroyed it, is what it says. And so Lot chases what looks good. Whereas Abram takes the time to invest into the soil and because Lot is just chasing how things look, he, he fails to realize the Bible says right there that the men of Sodom and Gomorrah did wickedly. And so he, he's looking at something that's well watered, something that looks good, something that's appealing to him rather than investing the time. And he's willing to ignore the fact that he's leading him, his family and everyone following them. He's leading them towards a place where the, the Bible's already pointing out the men are already doing wickedly. He's willing to ignore that because like when we started out, to him, the grass was greener on the other side. So let's deal with that a little bit, Brother Mitchell, um, because... Now we're talking about one's definition of success. And maybe that definition of success needs to be cultivated early in one's life and needs to be 
given to God because Lot perceived a definition that really did not have the, the blessing of God. <coughs> and the, the wicked men affected his whole family. The wicked city affected his whole family. Here's the sad thing about that story is Lot evidently was saved because we find him in Hebrews chapter 11 in the, in the archives of faith, the heroes of faith. But none of his children that I'm aware of, none of his family, his offspring, the only offspring that we have remaining became enemies <coughs> to God's people. Moab, which is where Ruth the story of Ruth originates, and then the other one, I can't think of uh, the other child that was born out of Lot in the incestuous affair with his daughters that was initiated by them. Evidently, they learned that in Sodom. And, and, uh, uh, and so one's definition of, fa of success needs to be cultivated. Yeah. Well, and it, it goes on and on. Like, for instance, before we started this, you were listening to your pastor, and that's he was talking about. In, in the instance he was talking about is that when Jacob goes down to Egypt, he's not affected at first. It's just his kids. Abraham. Oh, it's Isaac. Or it's Jacob. Bishop was preaching about Jacob. Oh, I, I don't know that I've heard that one. Well, and by the time it's done, Jacob moves there. What's interesting to me is every time Jacob's kids... Now, we know God is ultimately oh, building Israel. Yeah. When he's following Joseph. Yeah, yes. I, I see where you're going. Now. But what's interesting to me is every time I, Jacob allows his children to go to Egypt, Egypt is asking him for his children. Leave Simeon. Bring me Benjamin. And we understand there's there's different types and shadows that are drawn out there, but that stuck out to me listening to him to speak. That is that he he was never able to get once his family had, had entered Egypt. He was never able to get his whole family out. There was always portions of his family that were in Egypt, and they didn't come out till the holy rebellion of Moses four hundred years later. You know, so uh, it was Moab and Ammon. Ammon, yeah, Ammon, the Ammonites. Yeah. And and this was this was just, you know the the soil is so important the soil of of cultivating good habits good conversation there's way too much filthy conversation today and and there are little uh, learn to speak well uh, there's nothing wrong with speaking well uh, and when I say speak well I'm not just using I'm not just talking about eloquence I'm talking about I'm talking about holy conversation. The Bible talks more about holy conversation than any other standard of holiness. Uh, <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace, grace. unto the hearers. Uh, well, and, another ahead. thing that, that's getting touched on huge here, and it's just, it just doesn't get brought up a lot. And in fact, I've, and a lot of times it's joking, but, but I have heard people say, don't pray for this. The other thing that's being mentioned here is patience. Like for instance, we talked about the, the tree that's not producing and has a time period of three to five years it's going to produce. And a wise, the wise hus husbandman, the one thing that's fascinating that he does is he comes and he actually realizes it's going to take longer to plant a new tree anyway. Yeah. You have to restart the cycle. So he says, why not give me another year before you, if you have to wait three to five years anyway, why not at least give me another year? It might produce in another year. But what he's asking for, he's also asking for time. Give me time to work with this thing. And in Psalms chapter one, it says that the the wise man brings forth his fruit in his, his season. season. Yeah. And it's, it's a nod to the parable that Jesus is telling about the tree that they're there is a season you produce in, and you have to be patient. Yeah. And Go ahead. this is just a side note, but but in reality, young people, I think God's going to give us patience whether we pray for it or not, because that's one of the attributes of God. 
And, and that's just how it is. You have well, to have that. You're either going to be patient or you're going to be bitter. That's the bottom line. So let God cultivate patience. The Bible says, with patience, bear ye your soul. And when, so. And when you, I mean, we're not talking about patience, but when you get to the end of the study of patience in the Bible, it is intertwined with faith. So you can't, I mean, if you're going to be a faith, that which is not a faith is sin. If you're going to have faith, you've got to have patience. Another thing you brought out in that psalm, and I know we're kind of going back, but <coughs> this is interesting. It says, his leaf shall not wither. And we briefly talked on, we, we touched on it. But another thing that the leaf does is the leaf is the sustenance of the tree. Yeah. And so what God is, what that psalm is telling you is even if it's not your season, you're not going to die. The leaf is how the tree eats, literally. Yeah. The leaf is what receives the moisture. It receives the sunshine and the photosynthesis takes place in the leaf. In fact, when you see green trees, it's not really the real color of the leaf. That is the photosynthesis process in the fall. When the sap goes back down into the roots of the tree and the leaves begin to die, you see the real color of the tree. But that's where the food takes place there. That's yeah. where the sustenance. So the bigger that tree gets, the more it can produce fruit. And then you get into the pruning process, which is later on in the, in the maturity of the tree. But the beginning of that tree is the soil. And in... In... in we don't want to get too far away from this. You don't have to move away to make the grass greener. You cultivate the soil. You water it. You let the sunshine of God's presence and his word and his enlightenment come into our life. And and that's the key to having the bountiful harvest. Um, Jeffrey and Mitchell, you and I, all of us before the podcast we were talking about uh when you transplant a, a tree the major i don't know how uh, there's a huge percentage of those transplants that don't make it i have i have some stuff here that says that in a transplanting of a tree this is according to the society of international arborist which an arborist is people that take care of trees really <laughs> I just want to make that clear okay. to everybody. Well, I'm I'm learning. I'm I'm not being facetious. I'm Those learning here. We'll cut trees and um, transplant. Transplant. They're very professional and all of that, and understanding. And they do grafting and everything. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty amazing what they can do. Um, and so, what it says is that it is estimated that during a transplanting process a tree will lose an average of 80 to 95% of the root system. And if they're very big trees, they have a big truck that has these huge claws that will go and wrap around the tree and dig down as far as it can into the root system and they'll get as much as they can. But those roots go so far out and they go so deep. When you cut all that, you can't get the whole root system. And what this study said was it takes an average of at least three to five years for that tree to become rooted and grounded enough to be considered stable. And so if you just, after cultivating the soil, after getting the right environment, after getting the right water, the river, after all of that, if you just uproot and just go off, to something else. And I'm not just talking about going to a different church or what, you know. Yeah, changing all of a sudden, you know. Going to a new, uh, you know, a new job or a new career or a new ministry. All of a sudden, <clears throat> you have taken all of that roots. Let's talk to married couples and, and the temptation. Well, this marriage is just not worth saving. That's our world right now. 51% yeah. of marriages yes. are not worth Young couple, let me tell you something. The most lasting marriages in the world are marriages that took place when you were young, your first marriage. The percentage of a second and a third marriage failing becomes astronomical. 
And so it's worth the time to cultivate that relationship. It's worth the time to cultivate the relationship with our children. And it's worth the time for children to cultivate the relationship with their parents. It's worth the time. Let me deal with some some side issues that are very important in our world. It's worth the time to cultivate relationships with foster children, with stepchildren. Uh, our world is just, you know, a, a microwave world. If it don't get done in five days, then it's just, it's hopeless. Well, there is no faith in that. The Bible says tribulation worketh patience, and patience worketh experience. Yeah. And experience worketh hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Not all works of the Holy Ghost are instantly. The initial reception and birth of the Holy Ghost is instant, just like the birth of a child is an instant time. It, what's Brother Wilson call it? A something instant. Primary event. Primary instance. event instance that's the birth but the maturity of that child is a lifetime and the maturity of relationships and the maturity of of god's purpose and wills uh, will taking place in our life that doesn't happen overnight in many cases when i was a kid i dabbled in martial arts now it's called mixed martial arts but it's always been mixed martial arts anybody that's ever been in combat sports or combat i've never been in real combat in jesus name i never have to be but you know if you're in a fight any length of time that if somebody recognizes that it's you're not familiar with fighting you're going to the ground they're going to take you to the ground you've got to learn to fight out of submissive postures you've got to learn uh and those kind of disciplines take years to learn and some of your greatest fighters are in later on in life, 37, 38 years old, because it took so much time to learn those various different disciplines. Well, that's the way life is. And, and if you want a successful marriage, it's not just going to happen. There's too much temptation to walk away from that. And you have to be committed. And faith comes from faithfulness. If you keep investing faithfulness, then it will it will produce. And we see in the book of Proverbs really talks about cultivating one's life. And and so many, I don't even want to get started in the book of Proverbs, but in one instance it says, how long will thou sleep, O sluggard, in reference to people that are lazy, that do not take life, take the initiatives of life. When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. And and you're going to look around one day, young man and, and young lady, and you're going to see other people. You're not going to be young then. And you're going to see other people have what you dreamed that you could have. And you could have had it if you'd have cultivated the soil. And you didn't have to go where they went. They cultivated the soil of their life. And I'm not just talking about geographically. I'm talking about getting committed to stuff early in your life and sticking with it. Yeah. Committed to walking with God. Committed. Made up your mind. Before I ever got married, I made up my mind that I was going to be faithful to my wife. And I didn't even know who my wife was going to be then. But I started cultivating that early. Yeah. I The only person that I've ever told in a romantic way that I love her is my wife. That's the only girl I've ever told in a romantic way that I love because I didn't, I, I wanted to cultivate faithfulness and, and in other areas, you know, of, of life that you see that this is so important. If I'm going to learn how to be faithful, then I need to start practicing early. I, we've talked about the soil, we've talked about the the plant, the tree, whatever you want to use in the cultivation of that. I wish we had time tonight to talk about the aspect of the river, which we don't want we'll to come back and talk about that again. 
But it, as you're talking, Bishop, about the cultivation of faithfulness to whatever aspect of life, church, relationships, you know, jobs. I'm thankful that my parents put that in me. I didn't just leave whenever it got bad at a job, you know. You get a cultivation of faithfulness, and that will sustain you through the hard times. But what I find is so significant in in bringing this to a close tonight is that we see the cultivation of faithfulness all the way into the book of Revelation. And and we don't have time to talk about the river. I wish we could. We'll come back and deal with that but later. We can talk about those trees in Revelation. Yeah. But we find the tree that is planted by the river of water because the Bible says, and he showed unto me in Revelation 22, when he showed me a pure river of water of life. This is in reference to Psalms chapter 1. Clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, which we didn't even get to Ezekiel, 36, uh, Ezekiel 47. It would be amazing to stop by there. But as that river is proceeding out in Ezekiel 47, the Bible says that everything that it touches, it begins to heal. It heals. Yeah. It heals. It's cultivating the land. And, and that river is proceeding out of the throne of God. And verse number two, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree, there was the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And it, here we find that this is in reference to the church. And it is talking about a, a tree that every month of the year, there is a fruit on it that is the healing of the nations. And young people, when you get a revelation of putting roots down, that faithfulness is going to carry you all the way into heaven. But what's so significant to point out is that there is a healing for the nations in that tree. There's a healing for those that are around you in that, I mean... They feed off of your faithfulness. Jesus talked about the mustard seed that became the great tree. This is the word that he uses. And the birds come and they begin to feed off of that. And people in your life, people that are dealing with relational problems, dealing with divorce, dealing with uh, they can't hold a job. And they look to you and they see that there is a faithfulness that can be achieved and can be attained. And it's because of young people that got a determination that even if I'm in the famine, even if I'm in the hard times, even if I'm in the struggle, even if everything's going good and I'm making lots of money, I'm still going to be in the house of God. I'm still going to be faithful to my wife or my husband, still going to love my children. And people, this world is living in such a society of unfaithfulness. And, you know, if you lose instability, a friend, yeah, it's an acidic environment. If you lose your friend and you, you get crossways, well, I just go get a new friend. But in the church, that's not how it works. And that is the healing for the nation. You know, there's so many, th you, you never can exhaust the word of God. It's so manifold revelatory. But when you talk about that, I am sitting here right now and I feel the spirit of prophecy. There are young people that are going to, they're going to exhibit things in their life their family never dreamed of. They're going to, people are going to say, I never dreamed that was in them because they took the time to cultivate that soil and they're going to produce. Some of them are going to be college graduates and yeah. none of their family members ever graduated from college and not just for the sake of being a college graduate, but because they have purpose in their life to do what God's called them to do. And they're going to exceed in their family. They're, they're, they're going to have marriages where their, their whole family history is broken relationships and they're going to produce fruit that they never Nobody in their families are, and everybody's going to sit around and scratch their head and say, how did they do that? Because the favor of God is on their life. Yeah. One hundred fold in a year's time. All of a sudden, 
that person that seems like an overnight success is not really an overnight success. They've been living for God and faithful for years. One more thing I want to point out before we dismiss. <laughs> before we have an altar call. <laughs> the music starts playing. and But um, you, Mitchell, you made mention of this, and Jeffrey, you did as well. The leaves of the tree are so important. There was a very interesting story in the children of Israel's deliverance. Probably should come back and even deal with this in great detail. But they came to the place right after God had brought them through the Red Sea. And they had no water to drink. The Bible says the water was bitter. It was, it was, the, it was the springs of marl, which means bitter. And in all of my studies, uh, marl, if it's the place where the scholars think that it is, it's really a, a it's a place along the coastline. So from all of my studies, what the Word of God is calling bitter was probably brackish water, salt water. They couldn't drink it. If you drink salt water, it'll kill you. But the Bible chooses to define that as bitterness. One of the things, young man and young lady, it's important to avoid in your life is bitterness. Bitterness is the rabies of the spirit. Go study what rabies does. Rabies affects the brain. It's a brain uh, uh, bacteria that will actually kill you. There is no, once you contact rabies, if they don't catch it early enough, there is no cure. You die. And you die a terrible death. And you die, you lose your mind. You tear and bite and rend. And and you, you become like a, a rabid beast. And And so... That's the way bitterness will affect people. And the Bible chooses, chooses to define this place as bitter. And it could have been something different. Whatever it was, they cried. And God spoke to Moses and said, there is a tree. And I don't know what kind of tree I've studied and studied. The only thing I can come to is that it was a... a <coughs> A mangrove tree. Yeah. And this is fascinating because they are literally right now, they've never figured this out. The mangrove tree is a different kind of tree. And the fact that it will, it can live in brackish salt or fresh water. It actually grows in the water. When you go to Florida, you can see the mangroves. In fact, I want to go fishing around them. It's a yeah. it's a really neat habitat for really good fishing. But what's so fascinating about the mangrove tree is that, and they've not figured this out, they're studying this, it will actually take the brackish salt out of the water, literally. It filters the bitter element out of that water, and it deposits it. He will deposit that in the leaves and then the winds blow it away. And so in our life, just an added note, has nothing to do with the soil, but you want to avoid bitterness. But if you get involved in bitterness, if you'll, if you'll come to Jesus, he's got a tree that's been very fruitful. Yeah. And uh, that nothing will ever take the place of Calvary, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and dealing with issues because you're not going to get through life, young man, young lady, without situations that will be tempting to become bitter. But when you get there, God has answers for that as well. Yes, sir. So, young people, we got to cultivate the soil. We've got to become great trees. we got to produce fruit. Jesus said, if you don't produce fruit, be cut off, and cast into the fire. And I don't want that. I know you don't want that. And I'm believing that God is going to move in the lives of, of young people that are listening to this, young people, middle-aged people, senior citizen people, whoever's listening to this. God's going to move in your life, and and in your cultivation, there will come a 
a fruitfulness, a fruit bearing, and you will, you will be the healing for the nations. I want to thank you again for being with us, for stopping by and listening to our podcast. We know that God is using it all over the United States, all over the world. God bless you. We can't wait to see you on the next round. Thank you.